and welcome to the Heart and Lung Research Podcast, a window into the world of research at Royal Brompton Harefield Hospitals. I'm Zara Aden, and today I'll be talking to Dr. Toby Marr about a lung condition called idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, shortened as IPF. According to the British Lung Foundation, IPF caused the death of over 5,000 people in 2012 in the UK alone. I'll be asking Dr. Marr about the recent research he's published into IPF and how this is making a difference to patients' lives. Dr. Toby Marr, thank you for taking the time to speak with us today. Can you briefly introduce yourself to the listeners and tell us how you got into researching this particular lung condition? Hi, so I'm Toby Marr. I'm an academic clinician at the Royal Brompton Hospital, which is to say that I both see patients and I run research projects. I've been working in this particular disease area since 2001. Uh, I got into it by accident, but discovered that it was a fascinating disease area with lots of unknown questions Uh, and from a research point of view it's both a challenging and fascinating area to try and understand the disease better but also develop new and effective treatments for patients. Some people listening to this podcast might not be aware of what idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis IPF is. Can you give us a brief explanation? So Idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis is a scarring disorder of the lungs of unknown cause. It tends to affect people older than 55 and becomes more common as people get older still. Uh, It is a disease where the lung becomes gradually scarred over time and as the lung becomes scarred it becomes less efficient and less good at getting oxygen out of the air and into the bloodstream. And so patients who develop the condition become breathless initially when they're walking around, but as the disease gets worse, they ultimately become breathless at rest. I understand that IPF seems to affect more men than women. Do we know why that is? So we're not entirely sure why idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis affects more men. We suspect it's partly because lifetime exposure to dust and smoke and things that can trigger injury in the lung increase your risk of pulmonary fibrosis. So historically men are more likely to have been cigarette smokers than women uh, and also men are more likely to have worked in heavy industry where they're more likely to have been exposed to to smoke and dust over a prolonged period of time. Considering the poor prognosis of IPF, why do you think it doesn't get the same media attention as say cancer or heart disease? So as you say, idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis has a very poor prognosis The average survival without treatment is about three years from diagnosis and the five-year survival is as poor as 25%. Uh, That makes it a poorer prognosis disease than many of the cancers that we see in clinical practice. I think it's typically got very poor recognition because historically there haven't been any treatments. That has changed in the last two years. Also because patients have died so rapidly there haven't really been any patient groups to help raise awareness of the disease and I think because it's occurred in older adulthood it's almost been a silent disease people don't know about it until they or one of their loved ones gets it. And is anything being done to help raise the profile of IPF? So I think in the last three or four years since we've seen the development of new treatments for pulmonary fibrosis There's been a drive to increase education of healthcare professionals. There's also been a drive to increase patient awareness and to increase awareness of nurses, uh, GPs and other healthcare professionals. And I think that's been happening in part through the big charities trying to raise disease awareness. It's being done by uh, newly formed patient groups trying to raise political awareness Uh, It's been done by NICE, the National Institute of Clinical Excellence, writing guidelines and um, quality standards. Uh, And it's also been done by NHS England, developing specialist services for patients with pulmonary fibrosis. So I think in the last four or five years, we've seen a number of important changes that have made people more aware of the disease itself. Staying on the subject of raising the profile of this condition, I recently watched a Korean drama where the main character was using the internet to self-diagnose a chest condition he was suffering from and he came across IPF. 
And I was just wondering, um, are there any plans to script IPF into a television <laughs> programme anytime soon? <laughs> Thank you for that question. Um, so certainly the internet has helped drive awareness. I think historically when patients were told they had idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, there wasn't anywhere they could go to get good information. Uh, Google and the internet have changed that completely. Uh, one of the challenges we have is actually the quality of evidence that people have available to them or the quality of information they have available to them. Uh, much of what is on the internet is um, factually inaccurate or often written in a way that terrifies people without providing them useful information. So certainly, again, we've worked with the charities to try and develop good information resources for patients uh, and the sort of information provided by the British Lung Foundation can be very helpful. It's interesting you ask about dramas. I have helped with the BLF to script a piece for a lunchtime BBC drama where one of the characters developed idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, so we have taken that approach. The research study that is the focus of our talk today is just one of many studies that Dr Toby Marr and his team at Royal Brompton Hospital are working on. This particular study looked into the potential use of home breathing tests for patients with IPF and was carried out in 2015 with the results being published earlier this year. Can you give us a brief overview of the study? So what we did with the study was try and monitor people's disease at home. So when we monitor patients with idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis in the hospital, we do a particular breathing test called the force vital capacity. To do that, patients breathe in deeply and they blow out hard and fast till they've blown out all the air in their lungs. And that reading, the force vital capacity, tells us about the size of the lungs. And as fibrosis gets worse, that reading gets smaller. Also, if patients suffer an acute exacerbation or an infection, that reading will also get smaller. So what we did was give people a handheld device that they could take home. So the handheld device that we gave patients was a spirometer, um, which helps to measure both the strength of someone's blowing out and also the total capacity of their lungs. So in technical terms, it measures the FEV1 and the FVC, the forced vital capacity. We asked them to measure their own forced vital capacity at home on a daily basis for a year and a half, uh, and we use that information both to understand the disease better, but also to try and pick up people who were having exacerbations of their condition. And what's the difference between FEV, forced expiratory volume, and FEC, forced vital capacity? Yeah, so the forced expiratory volume is the speed with which people blow out air, and that is dictated by the size of the tubes in their lung. Uh, so people who have conditions like asthma or emphysema develop narrowing of the tubes in their lung, and although they can blow out the right amount of air, it takes them much longer to do so. So if you imagine blowing out through a straw, it's a lot harder work to do it than just blowing out through your mouth. So the FEV1 measures conditions where there's narrowing of the tubes like asthma. Forced vital capacity measures conditions where the lungs shrink, so conditions like pulmonary fibrosis. I imagine that there might be a slight difference in the way someone carries out lung function at home compared to when they're doing at the hospital. Did you find this was the case for your study? So yes, it's true. In, in the hospital when we conduct spirometry, uh, there's a technician there who encourages people to blow out as much air as possible and who supervises the test to repeat it if it's not done properly. At home, we clearly didn't have that same level of quality control. Uh, what we saw was that the amount that people blew out was slightly less at home than when they did it in the hospital but it was very consistent over time, so it didn't ultimately affect the interpretation of the readings that were generated at home. And what were your findings? So in terms of the results, we looked at two or three things. So the first was just trying to show that it was possible to measure spirometry at home and to get readings that were informative and told us something important about the patient's disease. 
And so we were able to show in the 50 patients that took part in the study that yes, it is possible to monitor disease at home with spirometry. The second thing was to look at the natural history of idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. So the study was actually conducted before we had any of the current treatments available. Uh, and so we were learning about how frequently people have exacerbations of their pulmonary fibrosis, but also what proportion of people have very slowly progressive disease as compared to more rapidly progressive disease. And so we gained a lot of insight into how pulmonary fibrosis behaves between different patients. And then the final thing was to see whether using home spirometry might be a way of making clinical trials shorter in the future. So at the moment, clinical trials in idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis last for 12 months, which means if you need to follow 300 patients for 12 months, it often takes three or four years to run a clinical trial. What we've shown in this study is that you can find important differences at three months. So potentially we could dramatically shorten the length of trials for idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis and therefore help speed up the development of new drugs in the future. In your study it was mentioned that some patients dropped out midway because they were distressed by seeing their own daily spirometry results deteriorating. Could this be a potential issue for other home monitoring studies? Uh, so yeah, so we there were two reasons that patients dropped out. One, some people found that doing the test caused them to cough and that obviously was uncomfortable and over time they found that symptom too intrusive. The other challenge, as you said, is that people didn't like seeing their condition getting worse. Um, at the time, the challenge was that we didn't really have any treatments to prevent fibrosis and so although we could see people's condition getting worse, there wasn't really anything we could change in their treatment to try and alleviate that. Uh, we've now got two new therapies available, and so I think the next study that we want to do is to see how we can use home measuring of spirometry to tell us when patients should be on treatment and perhaps when they should change between treatments uh, and I think doing that and using it as a way of informing best treatment for the patient should in the future prevent this situation where people are in the distressing situation of seeing their disease getting worse without there being any options for treatment. And what do you think this particular study will add to the field of research into IPF? So I'm, I'm hopeful it will do one of three things. Um, as I've said, I think it will allow us to shorten clinical trials in the future and so there are now four or five different pharmaceutical sponsored clinical trials where the handheld spirometry is being used to see if we can shorten the study duration. Uh, the second is to help us understand better what causes acute exacerbations in patients with idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. So at the moment, acute exacerbations occur out of the blue, and it's been very difficult to do any studies where we identify them as they're happening. The home spirometry gives us a way of doing that, so I think in the future we'll try and build studies around the home spirometry so that we can investigate what causes exacerbations and how we can treat them. And then I think the third thing, as I've alluded to, is using home spirometry as a way of making decisions about best treatment for patients. Again, all of this will take further research to de deliver. I don't think we should be using home spirometry immediately as a clinical monitoring tool, but I think having shown that it's possible to do it, we can now start to develop the research projects to, to show its place in normal clinical management of people with IPF. Both personalised medicine and home monitoring are terms that have cropped up a lot recently. What exactly is personalised medicine and how do you see it playing out for IPF? Um, so personalised medicine is the idea that you treat patients as individuals, uh, which from a medical or sort of drug point of view means trying to identify which patients will respond best to specific therapies. So I think we all know from experience that some people seem to respond well to treatments, some people seem very prone to side effects from treatments, 
and ideally what you would like to do is try and identify before you start the drug who it is that's going to respond and who it is that might get side effects because that way you can choose the right drug at the right dose for the right person. Uh, at the moment we give everybody the same dose of drug and the choice is, is really based on clinical trials performed in large populations of people. I think in five or ten years time we will be better able to select the right drug based on an individual's particular pattern of disease uh, and so hopefully use that as a way of improving outcomes and reducing side effects. Judging from your answer, um, I assume that you think that personalised medicine is the future of medicine? Yes, yeah, so I think it's not just in idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis that this is going to be important. I think already in cancer we're seeing the development of personalised medicine and I think even in respiratory medicine the there have been attempts to introduce it for asthma and COPD and clearly we're keen to try and do the same for idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. A very big thank you to Dr Toby Marr for joining us today. If you'd like to find out more about the research being carried out at Royal Brompton and Harefield, including IPF, please visit our website at www.rbht.nhs.uk forward slash research. The National Institute for Health Research supported both the research mentioned in this podcast and Dr. Toby Marr through a Clinician Scientist Fellowship. Research was carried out in collaboration between Royal Brompton and Harefield NHS Foundation Trust and Imperial College London. An unrestricted academic industry grant was provided by GlaxoSmithKline Research and Development. Thank you for listening to the Royal Brompton and Harefield Hospital's Heart and Lung Research Podcast. <laughs>